We ended our last discussion about shalom, peace or well-being in the Psalms by noting that the early Christians found in that text models for life, including the pursuit of peace. Jesus, in particular, modeled in his own life that pursuit of peace. We cannot say, of course, that he was uncontroversial or even that he tried to avoid conflict. Not at all. At times, he sought out conflict in a higher cause of calling sinners to repent, the powerful to give up some of their power, and the vulnerable to trust in God's love for them. As followers of Jesus answered his call to follow him, they emphasized, among other qualities of life, the pursuit of peace. So we hear a greeting of Irini, peace, in every New Testament letter. It was not just a cliché, but an expression of a genuine hope in a small religion trying to survive in the vast Roman Empire, where peace often came at the point of a sword. We should end where we began then, with Jesus. The four Gospels remember him as a seeker of peace, but not in a simple, straightforward way. We hear him tell a woman healed from a lifelong malady to go in peace, Mark 5.34. And in Luke, we see angels announcing his birth as evidence for God's desire for peace, Luke 2.14. And in a sort of matching pair, the crowds at the triumphal entry expecting peace in heaven and glory in the highest, or in other words, God's victory over evil and the settling of all the old problems, Luke 19.38. We see the risen Lord greeting his huddled, confused disciples with the welcoming, Peace be with you, Luke 24, 36. And of course, Jesus does not work in the peace racket alone, for as Zechariah's song about his son John the Baptist makes clear, he, John, will be a prophet leading people on the path of peace, Luke 1, 79. Similarly, the fourth gospel, John, shows Jesus announcing his imminent departure from this world and comforting his stunned followers with a statement, I give you my peace, John 14, 27. He recognizes that they will suffer trouble in the world, but offers a place for the peace that the paraclete brings, John 16, 33. In short, Jesus' work as a healer, exorcist, and teacher of righteous living provides a powerful example of the art of making peace at its deepest. Even when he says harsh things, as he does fairly often, his aim seems to be the growth or rehabilitation of those whose religiosity has strangled their spirits. And yet things are not quite so tidy. In Matthew 10 and Luke 12, we hear the story of his dispatching disciples to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He sends his followers to bear good news of God's promise keeping to the heirs of the promise to Abraham. Jesus tells the disciples that when they enter a town, they must seek the hospitality of the locals because they will do their work without a safety net, without the basic economic planning that a prudent leader would insist upon. If the hospitality comes, then well and good. Then the disciples should offer their hosts their peace. But if it does not come, they should retract their peace and head on to the next town, Matthew 10, 12-13. They should expect both success and failure in their ministry. Or put differently, they should realize that success and failure are not theirs to measure. Faithfulness and unfaithfulness are the only standards that matter. Then the hard saying of Jesus in Matthew 10, 34 or Luke 12, 51. Do not assume that I have come to cast peace on the earth. I have not come to cast peace but a sword. For I come to pit a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, so that a person's enemies are those of the same household. What does that mean? At first, the text seems to contradict not just the common image of Jesus as the Prince of Peace, the paragon of mildness, but even Jesus' own statements praising the peacemaker. So we have to recognize that he engages in hyperbole, exaggerating to make a point, just like when he told lustful people to pluck their eyes out to make the sin stop. But realizing this obvious point, Jesus can employ a wide range of rhetorical devices to communicate with his audience, does not give us, get us all the way home. He chooses the shocking language, and it's definitely shocking, for a reason. Why? Part of the answer must be his recognition of the controversial nature of his own ministry and of that of his followers. It turns out that announcing that God wants us to turn to holy things and live holy lives 
gets in the way of some of our fondest passions, especially our desire to control other people and grab what of theirs we can. It turns out that often we do not wish to be free of the evil infecting our lives, and that sometimes the turn to God splits one person off from another. Faith can disrupt as well as heal. And what is more, Jesus is saying, as reported, reported here, quotes Micah 7, 6, a text that laments the tragedy of the prophet's world in which social structures are at war with themselves. But I wonder if Jesus doesn't also have in mind the next line of Micah, Micah 7, 7, which says, Yet I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God who saves me. Neither Micah nor Jesus sees the division of households as a positive thing. Far from it. It happens because of pride or fear or ignorance or all of those together. And it creates further pride and fear and ignorance as its effects roll along in wave after wave. The disciple of Jesus must trust that even when the main pillars of peace, peace in our most intimate relationships, crumble and fall, a positive future still awaits us. But there's one more thing here. Jesus follows up this line in Matthew and a little differently in Luke with the command to take up one's cross and follow me. The cross. The cross seems just about the least peaceful thing in the world. An instrument of torture and humiliation. The cross nails a body and a soul up to celebrate the power of the state. It's unanswerable invincibility. It's godlike certainty. The cross seems the very opposite of peace. And since Jesus is not simply a victim in a painful tragedy, but a volunteer in his own death, the cross must stand here as part of Jesus' challenge to all our normal assumptions about what peace is. How could a crucified teacher, whose disciples have compiled a 2,000-year track record of mixed results at best, exemplify the success of the pursuit of peace? Where is shalom, well-being, in all this mess? Jesus' statement about a sword rather than peace surely describes not only his own ministry, but the entirety of Christian history. And yet the Gospels do not understand Jesus' ministry as a failure, nor the life of the church as a disappointment. Rather, both manifest the work of God. And so we cannot stop with the notion of Jesus' bringing of conflict as a denial of peacemaking. Instead, we have to think that somehow Jesus has redefined the peace that we are to make. It cannot consist simply of keeping everybody happy or building up the sort of relationships we already want to have. Those cannot be the final results. That fact is hard to accept for the modern church, of course, because we've been so conditioned by ideas like friendship evangelism that we have come to think of the church as a social club of like-minded people. We seek conformity instead of holiness, amiable relationships instead of love for the neighbor, my friend instead of my God. Because of that confusion, we lose our ability to foster true peace, which can only result from our courageous attempts to love our enemies, not just our friends. Jesus' paradoxical statement, I am not bringing peace but a sword, reminds us not to get too comfortable in assuming that we know how the relationships of which we are a part should work. No wonder that the book of Colossians, again, as we mentioned in the first video, speaks of his bringing peace through his cross. The early Christians seem much less confused about all of this than we are. So to conclude, where do we go from here? If the Christian view of peace starts and ends with the cross, what must we say and do? If we hear its testimony to the shattered nature of human existence, to its practices of power and submission, how can we accept that testimony as true while also embracing a better way of living? Let me propose a few things. First, let us begin to think of peacemaking as a spiritual practice, just like prayer, fasting, reading the Bible, and all the rest. Second, let's consider the goal of peacemaking. And third, let's examine how peacemaking reflects not just a deep human desire, though that surely is vital, but comes out of the very nature of God. So one, spiritual practice. 
By spiritual practice, we mean a set of human behaviors that are sustained, thought through, and constantly evaluated. All of us understand at some level the kind of work it takes to become a skilled athlete or a musician. Lots of practice, instruction from skilled teachers, and the elimination of anything that obstructs the goal. You can't smoke three packs a day and become an Olympic sprinter. You have to give up some behaviors and take on others. And the same thing is true of a spiritual practice. I can't become a prayerful person until I give up a lot of distractions. I need a coach or a spiritual guide. And I need lots of practice listening to God, not just yapping at God. The same goes for peacemaking. I have to start with a goal in mind and give up behaviors that get in the way. Nelson Mandela once famously said at his release after a quarter century in prison, As I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. We must throw away the negative emotions that beset all of us. Bitterness and hatred, certainly, but also fear, the desire to please, the love of flattery, and on and on. And then we must take up the practices that build peace, courageous defense of the mistreated, hope for the delivery of the oppressors from their sins, and a willingness to listen and learn and grow in our own spirits. I cannot make peace among others until I have decided to seek peace in my own heart. Two, the goal. Why go to all this trouble? One could argue that conflict is the most basic feature of human social existence and that peacemaking is, is impossible, or at any rate is a soft-headed, sentimental sort of thing to do. Lots of people believe that. However, the biblical texts we've examined, and of course many others, seem to say that human beings can live together by working out their differences, ending the dominance of one over another, ensuring that all have enough to flourish while using their God-given gifts to serve. Human happiness is possible, not just in the stingy doses we often self-administer, but on a wider scale. Every effort in that direction reforms and matures the person making that effort and those for whom it is made. The effort is not wasted, as we see from countless examples of men and women who have prayed for peace. The history of the church, despite all its mistakes and failures, its conspiracies with evil people to attack the good, still counts many persons who dreamed of a different world. They opposed unjust wars, fed the hungry, agitated for economic justice, worked in slavery and abuse, and in doing so, they contributed to the causes of true peace. That kind of peace embraces justice and love in order to reflect the final goal of humanity, life with the Creator in a state of harmony. And then three, and finally, for Christians, peace comes from God. Many of the biblical texts we have heard understand peace as a gift, and not the sort of you put in a closet after you receive it, but the kind you use and enjoy and brag about and show to your friends and think about hard about how to reciprocate. God's ultimate gift is the gift of presence, the gift of relationship, and the genuine sharing of the divine nature with the creature to the extent that such a happy event is possible for limited beings such as ourselves. Peace equals freedom from turmoil, whether caused by inner disturbances or outward actions whether situated deep in the individual soul or spread across the relationships we find ourselves embedded in. This freedom from turmoil characterizes the nature of God, who is pure love and pure holiness. For in God, all the virtues that seem at war with each other on the human plane converge into one harmonious whole. Peace is access to that convergence. And that is why Jesus says that the peacemakers those who work to remove the causes of conflict, not just to suppress it, will wear the moniker, children of God. May we become so.